Hello everyone, this is Eslan from the Becoming a Doctor team. We're glad you tuned in for this tutorial during your evening. So this is Dr. Maheswaran and he's a junior doctor right now and he'll be running us through some acute medical scenarios, what to do in real life, what to do in practice. And it's going to be an interactive session, so if you've got any questions, any comments, feel free to throw them in the chat and Dr. Yafi will get to them when appropriate. Off to you, Yafi. Cool, thanks Eslan, thanks for that, that intro. Um, okay everyone, hi. Um, this is a very strange kind of uh, way to be doing this without with, without anyone in the room uh, with me but um, anyway thanks for joining me today and thanks for the to the um, becoming a doctor team for kind of putting this all on it's all it's really great that you're kind of making the most of uh, the, the situation at the moment um, so basically what we're going to do is go through um, some acute medical scenarios you, what you can see is from the title page is that um, this is kind of um, acute medical scenarios plus or minus a bit of wisdom um, from from me and, and, and others who've, who've come before you um, what I wanted this talk to be was kind of not not kind of just a, a recreation of um, your medical school lectures or postgraduate lectures, whatever whatever level you're joining this talk from, but also just kind of um, going into about how to organise your thoughts in situations. In these situations, the medicine isn't too difficult. It, it's something that you all come across um, when you hit the wards. It's situations that we've definitely come across um, when we when we started, um, but. Um, I think uh, this is just how to organise your thoughts, um, how to kind of recognise that going through these situations, when you do them in an acute situation um, in your exams or whatever, um, you probably reel off what you would do and it sounds like you can get it all done in five minutes. Actually, the reality is um, there's a bit more to do um, and it will take a little bit longer um, than that. And also there's just some friendly advice as well. So uh, let me just get onto the next slide um there's a little disclaimer there as well basically everything i say is kind of my views there there is some evidence base for it and um, this isn't a, a replacement of your lectures but um hopefully it's useful um and this is basically the session outline so we'll do a bit of an intro which is what we're doing now um then we'll go through three cases um as i said they're cases that you're probably familiar with um and then we'll go through a, a bit more wisdom at the end um as always, if you have any questions, feel free to just put them um, in the chat and I'll try to get through to them. Um, my email address is also um, on one of the slides a bit later on. So if you do have any questions or think of some questions later, feel free to email me um, and I will either sweat profusely um, and then answer those questions. Um, and if I don't know the answer, then I will try and find the answer or put you in the direction of somebody that does know the answer. Okay. So um, let's let's get started. Also, from looking down, I've sort of got got some notes here as well, just in case I'm blank because I don't want to do that in front of, of our lovely audience here. I think my mum is watching this as well. So, hello, mum. Okay, so uh, case one: uh, the unwell patient. So, uh, hello there. Are you one of the medical clerking doctors? I've got a 77-year-old gentleman, uh, Mr. Victor, who's just come up to the unit. He doesn't look very well at all. Um, he's got a high news score. That's their early warning score. You've probably seen that at the end of the bed on the charts. Um, please, could you see him next? Um, you kindly agree to go and see that patient. Okay, so um, the first thing is you don't have any more information other than that. I've deliberately left it quite vague, but you're walking across the hospital and that's the brief that you've got. Um, so as you're walking across the hospital, I think what's it's quite useful to do is just to think about um, what information do you need? Um, what order are you going to do things in as you go through them? Um, and do you need anyone else there with you? These are all things that you should be thinking about when you're going towards that situation. Um, I'll say it now, um, and I will come to this point again as we go on with this talk, is don't be afraid of asking for help. Um, it's absolutely fine. Um, asking for help in a situation where maybe someone will say you didn't need help, um, it's fine. All that's going to happen is you might feel a little bit, a little bit silly. That's not your fault. If someone makes you feel silly, that's their fault. Um, but not asking for help in a situation where you really should have asked for help. That's a situation you do not want to be in. So if you think you need help or you feel out of your depth in any situation, um, do, do ask for help. Okay. Um, so um, getting more into it. So just to recap, if you're just joining now, um, we are dealing with a 77 year old gentleman who the nurse has asked you to see, a Mr. Victor. Um, he doesn't look very well at all. He's got a high news score um, and they want you to come and see him. Okay. So um, your approach, um, I generally use this approach for all um, clinical situations that I'm getting involved with. Um, and that is just structure in your head what you're going to do. So um, when you're thinking about what do you want to know, you want to know a history of the patient, however brief that is, a history. You want to do an examination 
investigations and interventions and that's how you get as much information as you can um, about the situation and then once you've done um, those in investigations review those investigations if you're doing any interventions and whether that's giving fluids to increase the blood pressure um, or giving some medication review the patient afterwards to close that loop and see if that's actually done anything if that's um, had an impact on the patient because that, that that's really important as well Okay, so you get to the bedside and uh, Mr. Victor doesn't appear to be very well at all. Okay, he's slumped over in his bed, he's a bit drowsy and he's mumbling that he doesn't feel very, very well. Um, he's grey in the face and he's breathing very quickly. Um, the nurse um, has his latest observations all uh, ready. So he's got a heart rate of 110, he's a bit tacky. Um, his blood pressure is 85 systolic. He's got a high temperature, 38.5. Um, his O2 stats are 92% uh, on room air and um, his respiratory rate is 24. Um, so, I mean, looking at that already, you may begin to think of um, if you've got um, some differentials, um, some differentials just popped over to the next slide. Okay, so already from, from what it looks like at the moment, if you saw that um, in the hospital and if, if some of you have already started your placements already or from your medical school placements, if you saw that, you probably think this is a gentleman that's really not very, very well. If you saw those OBS, again, you would think this is a gentleman that's not, not very, very well. Um, but at this point, we're still not exactly sure what's going on. Um, so there's, there's more to do. So you would speak to the patient, find out more information, doing your history. Um, so um, you find out he's had a productive cough for three days. Um, he's got reduced oral intake and no significant past medical history. Um, he's a non-drinker, non-smoker, lives at home with his wife, um, and there's no history of recent travel. And we've got our OBS there before. So what could be going on? Um, and I just invite you to take a moment just to kind of think about um, what your differentials are. We'll, we'll say about 30 seconds just to think about um, what might be going on. Um, and always, as always, if you've got any questions, you can either email me at the end um, or you can just put some put some uh, some questions up on the chat. OK, um, and if you want to suggest your um, different tools you can you can put them up in the chat as well I'm um, having a little look cool yeah that, that's good good differentials yeah anything else Okay, great. So um, there are lots of things that could be going on. Uh, we, this could be a pneumonia. We think there's, you know, he's, he's got chest symptoms. There could be something going on um, with the chest. Um, thinking sepsis, yes. Um, and someone who, who's quite unwell, maybe they, they don't seem quite well, breathing very quickly, um, sort of lower down your differential list. You might think uh, there's a DKA. You might think there's um, a stroke. Has he had a fall and a head injury? Is he intoxicated? Um, but I mean, primarily looking at the picture that we've got here, we're thinking that this is something's going on with the chest. Um, and actually it is um, sepsis with a, a chest source. So um, what are you going to do? So before you look at the slide, um, there's this, all the slides, there's quite a lot of information on them. But if you kind of, we can send those out later. So if you focus on what I'm saying and then work through the slides a little bit later on, um, it's important to have those differentials just to kind of keep things in the back of your mind, even if you are fairly certain what it is. It's just a good practice for staying open to other, um, to, to other, other diagnoses as well. Um, some tips for this scenario uh, and, and the situation it is as you go through medicine is treat the problems as you find them um, and if in doubt ask for help um, assess the patient and then reassess the patient so as we said before you want to do your history we've done the history and now you're thinking about your approach you want to stabilize this gentleman do what you can to make him feel a little bit better okay so the best thing to do is start with your a to e approach um, i'm sure you're all familiar with with this approach um, so we'll, we'll just go through it uh, now and it will come in useful for the future cases as well um, the ATO approach is also really, really useful because you don't know from what situation you're coming from before um, you get to this gentleman. Sometimes you may be um, being dealing with a patient, another patient that's been unwell, or you've just been having um, a phone call with um, one of your regis or speaking to patients' families. So it's a good way to kind of get yourself organised um, and, and work through um, 
what's going on with this patient in a systematic way systematic way so looking at the airway can the patient talk is the airway patent are there any upper airway sounds like stridor which would suggest um, that there's some airway obstruction does he have a low gcs if if the patient's got a reduced gcs and you think that the airway is threatened that is a good indication firstly to put in uh, to find a way to supplement the airway with an adjunct um, and also to call for help if there's any time where you think that the airway is going to need management that's when you put the twos out that's when you need help and when i say put the twos out that's phoning double two double two um and getting the the emergency team um in the hospital um to come come to wherever you are um uh, and the team that will come to you would vary depending on which hospital you work at where i work you just say there's an adult emergency um, and they'll come to you okay um fine on room air, so someone just asked a question, what does room air mean? Room air is, is just when they're, they are breathing what, what as, as, as whatever you and I are breathing. So if you took my saturations now and it said that they were 98%, um, it would be 98% on room air. Okay. Um, stepping up from room air is you can have oxygen via nasal cannulae, which is when um, patients have, you, you often see them on the wards where they've got those tubes around the face. Um, and there's two little prongs that got their nose that those are nasal cannula uh, and then you've got face masks um, as well okay fine um good to see those questions coming in keep the, keep those questions coming um and if i don't get round to them sooner i will check periodically to see what's going on okay next is having a look at the patient's um breathing so you want to have a look at their respiratory rate which is how many times they're breathing in a minute i'm um, having a look at their oxygen saturations and have a look at what their saturations are based on what oxygen they are receiving as well um, a patient who's got lower saturations um, often if they're worse when they're receiving a lot of oxygen that suggests there is something that's very very wrong um, um, because it means they've got low saturations when you're doing something for for low saturations. Um, have, do, do a respiratory examination to have a listen to their chest, uh, have a feel for their chest expansion. Um, and also you might want to consider a chest x-ray as well. For a really unwell patient, what that will mean or often mean is um, doing a portable chest x-ray. So, um, and that's that's one of the x-rays that they're able to come to the ward and do that x-ray. Um, just to note, um, this is a mistake that I made, um, is that um, the quality of picture you get, the, the film that you get with a portable chest x-ray is not as good um, as the picture that you will get um, with when they go down to the radiology department to have one of those x-rays, just as something to bear in mind. Um, but a portable x-ray is useful for patients who are very unwell on the ward um, who you don't want to move down um, to have their x-ray done. Okay, um, then um, we're on to circulation. So having a look at their capillary refill time. So that's when you're pressing down on their fingers uh, to have a look at how quickly they refill. Um, examine, uh, having a, an assessment of their temperature, feeling the peripheries and saying, are they, are they kind of warm and well perfused or are they cool and clammy? And that suggests often that patients are peripherally shut down. Um, and also having a look at the urine output as well. Um, a patient with a poor urine output, that's a good sign of... Um, so it's a bad sign and it suggests that there's an um, organ hypoperfusion. So um, that's what you want to check. That's what, that we, we, uh, what you want to check for um, as well. Okay, while we're on circulation as well, we can see that this gentleman has got um, a low blood pressure as well. And what you can do for that low blood pressure um, is give uh, a fluid bolus. Um, if you're going to give IV fluids, what you need to do is you want to make sure that you have access. Um, typically in situations like this, that means um, to or, you know, a large bore cannula um, and you want to put them in, in a quite big vein. So if you can get them uh, in the anticubital fossa, um, that's what you want to aim for. Often that might be difficult. And if you can't get one, if you can't get one there then by means try the wrist but optimally you want to get a large bore cannula um, in the anticubital fossa as well um, and bear in mind if you're putting in a cannula that also takes time to get the equipment um, to actually get the cannula you may not get it first time keep trying um, but getting that access is really important um, and giving the IV fluids as well um, we'll get onto the fluids a little bit later on um, as well. Um, also, what you need to do is get bloods. That's your full blood count, your U's and E's, your LFTs. Um, there's a really good page on the DQ Medics, which I used quite a lot when I started, which just gets you familiar with um, which blood tests um, you want and which blood tests go in which tubes. And um, that's really important um, 
ideally have a look at that before you start working, but you will pick that up very, very quickly. Um, just remember, if you're doing clotting and an INR, um, you do that in the blue tube and make sure that you do fill that to an adequate level. There's a little mark on the bottle that you want to fill it to. Don't underfill that bottle um, because they won't accept it and then you have to go and do that blood again. Let me make the mistake so that you don't have to. Okay, so don't underfill or overfill um, the blue bottles for, for INR and clotting. Okay. Um, also uh, on circulation as well, I normally kind of put a, a cardiovascular exam in here as well, something to think about, um, and also get an ECG as well. If they're really unwell, you might want to put, get them on a cardiac monitor. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, next, disability, that's a level of consciousness, their GCS. You may have kind of assessed their GCS previously at A, um, have, have another look at it when you get to D, have a look at the drug chart, or, or, is there anything else, are there any, any other medications or sedative medication or anything that might be causing your patient to be a little bit um, drowsy, sort of opioids, sedatives, sort of diabetic medication. Um, and also when I'm there, I always like to think about anticoagulants um, as well. Um, and don't ever forget glucose. So um, you can send a lab sample, but get, get a, a, a finger prick. Tessa will get a blood glucose there as well. Um, and um, finally, exposure. So rashes, look for any evidence of wound infections or, or you know, if you're thinking this is sepsis, it's it is a source of a wound. Um, are, and are there any other injuries from this gentleman? Um, you know, you have, is, there, is there bleeding or um, anything else? Are they, are they mockied? Okay, so that's kind of your A to E approach. Um, I think it's something you're probably fairly familiar with. Um, and I'm sorry if it feels like this is labouring the point, but it really is important. Um, um, and um, it kind of helps you to organise your thoughts. Okay, um, so moving on from the A to E approach. Okay, so, so you suspect that uh, Mr Victor um, meets the criteria for sepsis how will you respond okay again take take a um, couple of seconds just to think about what you're going to do in this situation where you've got a gentleman who you think is septic um, in hospital what are the things that you want to do um, have a thought about that you can pop them up on the chat if you want to or just um, just think about them in your head and we'll give it about 30 seconds um, and then we'll, we'll crack on Okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, back in again, some good suggestions there. Some of you sort of sliding into private messages too. That's where I'm sliding into our DMs, lovely. Um, okay, so um, fine, yes. So uh, yeah, I sort of heard lots of things, kind of heard about sort of giving three, taking three, very, very good. Oh, yep, some more messages coming through, lovely. Okay, yep, so yes, good. So what you've, you've spoken about, we've heard something about sort of the sepsis six, um, which you, you should all know about. I think the way that people have been told that is, um, is to give three, take three. That's very, very good. So what you want to do, you want to give oxygen. And this is a gentleman who's got low oxygen saturation. So you want to give um, oxygen, you want to give um, fluids um, as well. He's got that low blood pressure. So you, what you'd want to do is you want to give a bolus of fluid. Um, that can be sort of um, 250 or 500 milliliters um, of saline. When we say bolus fluids, what we do is that's a, that's a bag that's given or however much you say as a bolus and that's given straight away. Um, times when you want to be cautious with that um, are patients who are old and frail um, or patients who may have heart failure. Um, when you're giving lots of fluids and when you're giving them quickly, um, you don't want to overload them. So that's something just to be a bit wary about. But yes, that's very, very good. Um, and also you want to give antibiotics. Okay, um, things that you want to take. So you want to take urine output um, and that can be via a catheter um, where you catheterize the patient and have a look at the urine that they're producing from the bag. As we've said before, urine output is important because a low urine output, oliguria, um, is a sign of organ hypoperfusion and you'll be worried about that. Um, or if you think that the, they, they don't need a catheter, say they're a little bit younger and you think that actually you could um, collect that urine just from, from the bottle and keep an eye on that with an input output chart, that's also adequately fine, um, adequately fine, adequate. Um, and also you want to do um, 
cultures and you want to measure their lactate. And someone might be wondering, how do you get a lactate? You can get that quickly um, doing a VBG. Okay, so what this practically looks like with this patient is you're going in, you're giving them their oxygen, you're taking, you're putting in the cannula, you're taking bloods as you, as you can take bloods as you put in um, a cannula. So you might take your bloods via that way. Um, you also want to take some blood cultures. Ideally, take your blood cultures before you give antibiotics, um, but don't let that delay giving your patient the antibiotics. Um, you've given them the fluids via the cannula, you're measuring the urine output and you're measuring the lactate when you take your bloods. And do you do at, at least you want a um, purple tube, a yellow tube, a blue tube um, and a venous blood gas. Okay, that's a VBG. And then someone, either you or someone else can go to the blood gas machine and have a look at what that lactate is. Okay, so that's kind of what your sepsis six looks like, and those are, those are practically what the steps are. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more work in that than just um, the time it takes to say se sepsis six, and that's something I found when I started working. Actually, you find that um, in in making these patients better and optimizing them and doing your plan, there's a lot more that you need to do. Um, when we get onto the topic of, of of antibiotics as well, there's lots of things to to remember. Firstly. Um, check the allergy status of your patients always check the allergy status if you're not sure get sure check the notes check the history before you're giving those antibiotics um do they have a history of any renal disease um or, and, and are you going to have to adjust the dose for a renal dose um are there any interactions with the medications that they're taking um ideally you want you want to have an end or a review date for those um, antibiotics as well um and also just to be careful as well for um, antibiotics such as gentamicin and vancomycin, um, both for renal adjustments and also checking the, um, the levels of the, the levels of a gentamicin and vancomycin in the blood as well, because that, that can affect um, the doses that you subsequently give as well. Um, just note that with vancomycin, there is um, a difference between the loading dose and the maintenance dose. Um, I won't go into the specifics here because it is trust specific. And I think if I told you what we do in my trust, that's going to be different to, to, to what's going to happen in, in, in the trusts where you work. But um, the main point I want to illustrate there is just to be aware um, of, um, of, of things to keep in mind when you're prescribing antibiotics. And it's, not, it's not just the case of, of just blindly prescribing them. Um, okay. Another thing is that this is a gentleman who is um, quite unwell. So it's important that you inform a senior. If a senior hasn't been involved directly with the management of this patient, you need to tell them at least what you've done and that you've implemented that plan. Um, if the patient isn't responding to initial therapy or you think that they are deteriorating, call for help. I cannot stress that enough. Um, and there's a slide later on which says all the people that you can use a resource if you need help. Um, we'll get onto that later but i cannot stress enough if you need help you think you need help or you're out of depth ask for help um, it's really really important um, also you want to document clearly so document your plan everything else that you've everything you've learned everything you know your plan for that patient make sure that the nursing staff are aware um, of what the plan is and they know um Kind of what if it's on nights or whatever they know when to call you if if there's something else that's going on with that patient and that you want to come back and see that patient straight away you should be going to review that patient anyway um, and also if it's coming to the end of the shift um do you make sure you hand over or there is some way that um, someone is going to check on that patient uh, later um as well okay now going on to who you can cause for help who you're going to call so this is there are a couple of quotes and things from um films and, and famous people that sort of drop those little easter eggs um into this talk so sort of if, if you can pick them out there you go but if you need help there's lot there's lots of different sources and you and, and and help means lots of different things sometimes it's advice sometimes it's just simply another pair of hands to do things for you whether it's putting in that cannula so you can do something else or getting someone to listen to the chest or anything like that other fy1s other shos your team registrar medical res registrar critical care outreach consultants putting out the twos um, and there are loads of useful resources as well um, so do do use them as i've said there in bold on the on the, on the on the screen you're not expected to know everything by heart not at all um, and that's why all those guidelines and all those resources um exist um just oh, I've got a message sorry Yeah, so just um, just so that um, you can use that as a reference point. So whether it's trust guidelines, um, society guidelines, um, 
and then uh, you know phoning switchboard if you don't know what the bleep number is or you don't know how to get a hold of someone um you've got all those resources there's a fantastic app called induction um which um which you'll be able to use in the hospitals wherever you are uh, and that will give you kind of the bleep sometimes they're not always right but it's a good way of keeping um, tabs on, on, on who you can speak to and when you need them so induction is great I sometimes when I start a shift I just normally when you have the little paper with your list on I'll just write down the bleep for the med reg um, biochemistry some of the F SHOs um, radiology um, which are just common um, common things that you're going to need as you do your own calls okay perfect is everyone happy with that does anyone have any doubts any questions any queries um, I'll say it now and I'll say it again there's no such thing as a silly question the only silly question is a question that you don't ask um and um happy to answer them so if you have any questions um and even if, if you don't want to ask them in front of everyone just um, send me a private message that's absolutely fine okay so oh someone's connecting Oh, so someone's asked, um, why do you have a biochemistry bleep? Okay, so sometimes out of hours. Um, so where I, where, I, where I used to work, out of hours, um, often um, it's if you need to get um, some test results quite urgently, then you um, just you bleep biochemistry. So they, they know, oh, this is someone that needs results urgently just because they're not running their daily telephone service. Um, it can be the same with radiology, for example. Sometimes we have a number that we can phone down um, for radiology or there's a number you can phone to get a chest x-ray put in the wards during the daytime but outside of normal working hours um, it's a bleep um, instead uh, and that's just because they're not they're not manning there's there isn't someone constantly manning that phone but there is someone on the bleep um, but it's quite useful just to be familiar with those systems um, in the hospital as well it will normally take a couple of sort of you know a, a couple of shifts at least to kind of get used to um, kind of get used to that um, system as you go okay perfect um okay so cracking on so um back to our session outline just going over what we've done so far so case one um if in doubt ask for help cannot stress that enough um be thorough in your documentation and your plans as well document clearly and make sure that um, you hand over so that uh, and that's both to ensure that so if someone um comes along that they can see um, what you've done for this patient, they can have a quick understanding of the history of that patient um, and they know what's been implemented, what's been done so far, and that can inform um, their plan. Okay, fantastic. So uh, coming on to the next um, case, okie doke. So uh, case two, the falling patient. Um, I kind of tried to think of original titles for these kind of like making them sound a bit like Sherlock Holmes stories hasn't really worked has it um anyway so uh again call to uh you get another call lovely hello are you the ward cover doctor my patient Minerva lovely name has just had a fall please could you come and review um okay you agree to see the patient and walk over to the ward Okay, um, so um, on your walk across the hospital, what again, what are you going to think about? You don't know anything else. You're just going over, you're going over to the ward. Um, and, you know, this is quite, I, some, I sometimes think if, if you've got the time as you're going, walking across the hospital to that ward to, to deal with the situation and you don't know anything else, it's quite a nice way to just kind of get your thoughts ready and think about what you're going to do. So um, we've already spoken about an approach you can use, which is your history, examination, um, investigations, interventions, review systems, so you kind of have a structure when you get to the bedside of what you're going to do, but also you're thinking this is the patient that's fallen. Have they had a fall um, out of bed? Have they had a collapse? How old is the patient? Um, have they had a head injury? Have they had any other injuries? What are you going to need to do? What other information do you need? It's all about getting information. Okay, so um, and there, as you can see, when it comes to falls, um, falls slash collapses, there's such a broad um, list of differentials. Um, in medical school, we had it kind of kind of broken down quite simply into into kind of thinking of neurological and psychiatric causes, and thinking about cardiac causes, um, and then thinking about if it's polypharmacy or other toxins. Um, but there are such a broad range of of things that can cause a patient to fall um, to the ground. So it can be due to stroke. It can be due to is it a seizure, are there arrhythmias, um, polypharmacy itself, so literally just um, the el elderly who are on lots and lots of medications, that itself is a risk factor for falls. Um, 
is it hypoglycemia, I've put that in bold because don't ever forget glucose. Um, and then are there musculoskeletal issues? So is it arthritis? Is it a disuse atrophy? Um, or is it a mechanical fall? Um, I'm a 26 year old man, had a mechanical fall um, embarrassingly on the wards a, a couple of months ago, it happens. Um, so lots of things um, to kind of think about. And it's important to have, as I said before, that broad differential list, which you can then narrow down um, as you get to it as well. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list. None of the lists in, in these slides are exhaustive, um, but it is, it, they are just kind of some important things um, to think about as well. Okay, um, so you arrive on the ward um, and lovely Minerva um, has been helped back into the bed. Um, how are you going to assess her? What are you going to think about? So firstly, it's a history. Um, and again, don't focus too much on the slide because it's a really busy slide. Um, just kind of focus on what I'm saying or my face if you want to. Um, so first of all, who, who, who who was there when the patient had, had the fall? Was it witnessed? Um, that gives you an idea of, of why that patient fell. Should they have been being watched um, just because they're at a high falls risk? Well, specifically, what happened? Do you know what happened before the fall? Were there any visual changes? Did they have any symptoms? What happened during the fall? Was there any seizure activity? Um, and you know, afterwards, did they vomit? Was there any loss of continence? So what kind of things we're, we're gearing towards maybe whether or not this is a seizure. Where did the fall happen? Was it in the bathroom? Um, was it um, on the ward? Um, if it's a new patient, so you're seeing them in, in A&E or, or more, more likely on AMU, um, was it outside? From what height did they fall? Um, uh, why? Sometimes you can ask the patient, why did they fall? They might have, they might have said, oh, I felt a bit jittery or um, may come out and say, I tripped. Um, when did it happen again was the patient trying to move themselves out of bed when they shouldn't have been doing that um did they lose balance were they getting up out of bed are you we suggesting that maybe this is um sort of, sort of sort of hypertension um how many times have they fallen as well sometimes multiple falls um is something that should kind of set um alarm bells ringing as well because it means that if they're at risk of multiple falls something else is going on and, and you might want to think about you know if, it, if it's a patient in the community who's having multiple falls um and they're living alone you might want to think about or rethink um, their um, living situation and discuss that. Okay, so getting the history, that's really important. Also, don't forget your systematic review. Remember, going back to that slide, there's such a broad range of differentials here, touching on many different symptoms. So make sure that you are covering them or you're considering them when you do your systematic review. Um, and also a medications review as well. Okay, um, can anyone tell me why doing a medications review might be important? And you don't have to put it on the chat, that's fine. Um, yep, really, really good. Good. Hypertension, yeah, yeah, yeah. And good, yes, it's very good. It, it rhymes with banti coagulation as well. Good, whoever said that, very good. Uh, fine, so anticoagulation as well is something to remember and we will get onto that a little bit later. So getting on to kind of your approach, again, doing an A2E approach with any patient is absolutely fine, even if it's just a mechanical fall, it gets your, your thoughts um, aligned nice and organized and, and you can approach them in a systematic way. Your A2E approach, check that everything's okay, are you happy? Um, with that, um, then you want to do a cardiovascular examination, your neurological examination, um, check for any C-spine tenderness. Did they hit their head? Um, again, that's why doing that neuro, those neuro exams are really important. Is there any focal weakness? Having a look at their pupils, are they speaking okay? Are they slurring? Um, do they have any pain? Do they have any reduced joint tenderness? Um, it's important to ask, ask where did that patient um, impact the ground? Um, and you want to examine that point of contact with the ground is there any bruising i've been to some falls fall reviews where you have a look and there's lots and lots of bruising um on their legs and that was also just because of because of the, their anticoagulation too and we wouldn't have known that um, if we hadn't done the full e the exposure um when we were doing the, the a to e approach as well okay so just lots of things that you want to factor in as well um the summary of that is a to e approach systematic review cardio exam neuro exam um check the spine um, and also just make sure you do uh, adequate exposure to check for bruising and any other injuries it's really really important okay also you want to consider their things beyond that as well their social circumstance so and um, with this case we kind of said it's a patient that's had a fall on the wards but you know you can apply a lot of this to if a patient comes in um, to hospital uh, and you're seeing them in amu um, the acute medical unit if they've had a fall 
as well to think about their alcohol intake um, their alcohol intake just said that again i wasn't sure if i said that clearly and also um their mobility status um so do they have any mobility aids what is their baseline as well okay uh and as we said before medication is really important For polypharmacy that's a risk factor um, are they on beta blockers that can cause uh bradycardia are they on um, sort of, uh, do they have diabetes, diabetic medication, hypoglycemia, benzodiazepines, if that's a sedative, um, antihypertensive for the hypotension, and also anticoagulants as well. Um, anticoagulants are also really, really important because um, that's, you know, if, if, if they're not taking this properly or that, you know, that can be uh, an important uh, risk factor for having an intracranial hemorrhage, for example, if they've had a fall and they've hit their head as well. Just got a message here, let's go check that. Okay, so if a patient had a C sign uh, injury or fracture after the fall, what do you do? So again, that would depend on where you are. If you're in A and E, um, then there are certain things. I'm not expecting you to be in A and E, but you would. Um, firstly, you can escalate that to someone with more expertise, and what they would do is you would look at immobilizing that fracture. Um, you would uh, and and looking to sort of fixate that. Um, if it's a C-spine injury, it's important that you don't move that patient and they would need to be put on blocks. Again, that's something that you're not expected to be able to do. And then you would want to phone someone, um, person to, to kind of see if you're suspecting a C-spine injury um, would be um, TNO, for example. That's a, good, um, that's a good team whose expertise you want to capitalise on if it's someone who's got um, some head injury, or if they've got a, a C-spine injury as well. Um, ED will be well equipped for dealing with that. They will get that a lot with their trauma. Um, and then on the wards, um, part of your trauma team, uh, they're, all, they're also liaised with the team in ED, so they will be the people that can help you with that. Okay, a good question. So would you hold all anticoags after every fall? No, so you don't hold them all after every fall. Um, just because, you know, if it is just one, one fall, it's just a minor bump that they've had, you don't need to stop that. It's, you would consider um, suspending those anticoagulations or revising um, the anticoagulants they are on um, if it's a patient that's having multiple falls. So, for example, we had a patient who, um, uh, so when I was on um, Jerry's who had multiple falls, they were also on anticoagulation and it was a case, and they were on that for AF and it was a case of weighing up um, the risks and benefits of having lots and lots of falls whilst they're on anticoagulation or um, not being on anticoagulation, having that as a risk factor when they've got the falls, um, but also then being on AF and it is, and, and that stroke risk. So it's weighing those, those benefits up. Um, and again, that's a really good question. With that, it's always a good thing for you to consider um, and you would run that past um, a senior as well. Okay, does that make sense? Perfect. Okay, so, um, cracking on, Ooh, next slide. Okay, so there's lots of different investigations um, and when it comes to patients who, who've fallen this is not uh, an exhaustive list again this is not the list of things that you want to do for everyone every time they fall but it's a case of assessing the situation if you think that maybe th there's been an episode of postural hypertension then it's good to have a lying and standing blood pressure um you want to do a year and dip if you su suspect it might be due to an infection for example if you think it's due to dementia or there's been some cognitive impairment amt is good um blood glucose again really really important um, imaging again is important. So um, I think CT, the, the CT head uh, conundrum is one that, that you'll encounter quite a lot where you've had a patient, maybe they're on anticoagulation, they've fallen um, and, and, and they've hit their head. Again, it, it, it's not an absolute um, and whatever decision you do, you do have to justify. There is some nice guidance um, on it. Um, and if there's any doubt, always do discuss it with a senior. Um, things that you want to be concerned about is the anticoagulation they're on, their INR, um, has there, is there any new neurology? Is there any focal weakness? Um, can you see any facial droop? Um, can you see uh, sort of unequal pupils? It, can you see anything that suggests that there might be some intracranial pathology or has anything said, um, suggested that you are worried um, that there is some intracranial pathology for which you need to have um, a CT head. Um, for other imaging as well, say they've got, they've injured their, their elbow, there's reduced mobility, you think there might be a fracture, again, um, that's, that's a good reason to, to get, get that x-ray. When it comes to requesting 
imaging that's something that causes people quite a lot um, of anxiety as well especially when you're starting out um, I think the thing is you're requesting scans uh, and often the reason you're requesting it and requesting access to to, to, to a resource that isn't um, isn't there for, for for everyone all the time um, is you need to think about why that patient needs the scan so think about why they need the scan what's that scan going to tell you how is it going to change management um, and when you've got all of those together then you can put together a good request and send that um, off to your radiologists um, in the hospital that I've worked at for, for, for CT Hez you then have to phone the radiologists and request the scan and, and, and have a conversation with them again which is something that might cause a lot of you uh, a, a lot of anxiety um, I've definitely sort of sweated profusely over um, doing um, sort of having to speak to radiologists about scans um, but actually don't it, it's nothing to worry about um, as long as you've got the information you communicate clearly you think about um, why you want the scan what it's going to tell you and you can communicate that clearly to your to the radiologist or the, the custodian um, of, of, of the scan it should be fine if you find that there's no you don't have enough information or you're not quite sure why the patient needs a scan um, often if you then ask your radiologist for that that that's a request that's not going to work so either find out more information or ask someone who does know a bit more information to speak to said radiologist um, about that and to request that scan okay so i think the, the main point there is don't fret when it comes to requesting radiology i had to do that on my first day um it i thought it was going to be traumatic i really built it up in my head um and kind of got onto the phone and said everything really really quickly um and the, the person on the phone the radiologist said can, can you say that again please um and i, I, I got work so worked up that i just blurted it all out and it was rubbish um and then he was very kind and kind of took me through everything slowly and that, that was really really lovely so um it's absolutely fine don't be scared just be confident back yourself you'll be great um, and just think about the reasons why why you're doing that scan okay uh, and there's other specialist um tests as well these aren't things that you'll do straight away in the hospital but these are things to think about after you've managed the patient and uh, some of these can be done um, as an outpatient so such as in 40 48 hour tape um and an echo okay so um i think with falls we said there's broad differentials um so you've done you've done your history you've done some management you've stabilized the patient you've got the scans that you need everything is fine but there's always a bit after the fall that you can think about as well and that's thinking about why the patient uh, fell and is there anything you can do to mitigate against future falls um so you can have physiotherapy um review their medications again ensure there's adequate hydration um is are they having multiple falls because there is an, there's, there's an alcohol problem that's been going on that wasn't apparent when you first saw the patient but you, you that has, has come to the light a bit later on alcohol cessation advice um there's lots of things as you can as you can see on that slide and, and the main reason i put that up there is is just to kind of encourage you to think that um you know your, your job doesn't just stop when you manage the immediacy of that problem there is also the after the aftermath um to think about and things that you can do to prevent that um issue um recurring and happening again and again and again okay um, another thing to think about we spoke about anticoagulation so um, as you know um, you may have heard something about vte assessments or the phrase you may have heard on the wards um, is namely a senior doctor yelling do the VTE assessments um, on the wards. A VTE assessment, a VTE assessment um, is um, all, lots of patients when they're in hospital because they're not moving around, they'll receive um, anoxaparin or thromboprophylaxis to prevent um, the development of clots because of that stasis in hospital. Um, and regularly um, you need to do an assessment of patients based on their comorbidities, their, their mobility status, and other medications they're on, whether they've had surgery, et cetera, to see whether or not they need to be receiving that daily anticoagulation as a little injection um, in, the, in the tummy, for example, or, or whether they don't. Um, and they expire, I think it's every 48 or 72 hours. Um, so you have to keep doing them. Um, some computer systems in hospitals don't let you do anything unless you've done the VT assessments um, and you just get a notification. So just my advice to you is do um, your VT assessments is really important. OK, fine. So uh, key things from the fallen patient um, is be systematic in your approach. Consider all those differentials uh, and, and kind of break it down and structure it in your head. Use that A to E approach, as we mentioned before, and also do your history, your examination, your investigations. Um, etc and don't be scared of radiologists as well okay back yourself be confident and communicate clearly uh, it will be fine okay fine okay on to the next one 
fine. So case three, um, just a spoonful of sugar. So, uh, Dr. Doctor, um, Dr. Doctor, um, Doctor, please can you see this patient next? 66 year old gentleman, insulin dependent diabetes. He's become more drowsy, looks very sweaty, very unwell. BMs are 3.1. Okay, so low BMs, alarm going off. Um, you agree to go and review him. When you get to the bedside, he appears very sweaty and is responsive, but quite slowly so when you think of bms if essentially it's quite simple if their sugars are low you want to you want you want to replace um you want to replace them really so this is taken from the joint um it's on the slides it's like, i think there's a joint um society or diabetic societies uh, for inpatient care and these are some of the symptoms the most common symptoms um for patients um, who are who are hypoglycemic so yeah just just have a look at that and familiarize um yourself with that okay so, um, kind of the rules with hypoglycemia, four is the floor. You don't want your BMs any lower than four. Um, when you go to your patient, you think um, you want to have a look at them. Are they able to swallow or not able to swallow? If they are able to swallow and they're conscious, then you want to give them um, some quick acting carbohydrate. And that can come in many forms. So examples of that would be um, sort of a bottle of glucose juice, um, two to four heaped teaspoons of sugar, um, 15 to 20, so sort of a, a cup of fruit juice anything that's going to act quickly and get those BMs up. If they're not able to swallow, okay, and you're, you, there's a threatened swallow, there's an airway problem, A to E, and that's, that's an indication to get help. Um, get help, also get access, because it means you're going to have to give them intravenous um, sugar. So that's your 200 millilitres of dextrose over 15 minutes. Um, that's, what we, that's what we use in our trust. I don't know if it's different for wherever you'll be working. Um, if you can't get IV access, again, get a help because you, you will need to get that access and you can give them um, intramuscular glucagon instead. OK, so just just be aware of that. OK, um, you've got you'll have hypo boxes on the wards as well uh, for when your blood sugar gets a little bit low. Um, someone told me it's essentially a snack box. Um, I mean, it is. Yeah. Um, but um, this is the box you want to be familiar with. It's an orange box and it has lots of things that you'll need when you are responding to um, hypoglycemia. OK, um, if the BMs then return to a buff four after you've given the rapid acting, uh, rapid active sugar, um, then you can give some long acting carbohydrate just to keep those BMs up. Um, but if they remain low, even after you're giving your rapid acting sugar, you're giving it intravenously, they're still not coming up again. Get help. OK, if you find that the BMs have corrected, so the BMs, that's their, their blood glucose, um, if they have corrected, but the symptoms are persisting, then that's a, that's a good reason to think about other causes, whether is there a head injury, is there intoxication, is there some cerebral edema, has this patient had a stroke, okay? Um, and also if you find that um, there's persisting patterns of um, sort of low or raised BMs, um, then that's a good reason to consider the insulin doses as well, okay? So, um, thinking about um, whether or not they're receiving too high insulin at a certain time of day. Generally, the rule is um, if you are having a look at why they've got erratic BMs, why they're, 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 their blood sugar is high at a certain time of day, um, they're too high or they're too low, um, look at the insulin that was given before. So say they're on a, a two-dose or uh, sort of bi-daily um, insulin dose. If the evening dose, the evening insulin, um, will affect the morning blood glucose and the morning insulin will affect the evening blood glucose. So just think about the insulin that you're given before. Um, as we've said, there is such a broad reason why um, someone have, might have sort of deranged blood glucose levels, um, whether it's, um, you know, from terminal illness, they've had an increased exercise, which is kind of, that's lowering their blood sugars, increasing age, early pregnancy. Are they vomiting? They have reduced appetite. Have they been nil by mouth? And have they been kept nil by mouth for much longer than they need to be? Um, and have they not had access to um, the usual snacks that they would have if they're outside of hospital? So they're not keeping their blood sugars levels up um, or they're not having that, that level of, of sugar coming into them as they normally would do. Um, if they were outside of hospital. So those are just um, some other things um, to think about as well. Okay. So again, with a spoonful of sugar, the main important thing, and I think I'll kind of sort of trickle that in as a, uh, as a, as a theme throughout the previous cases is think glucose, test glucose, um, and just take care when you're prescribing their diabetic medication. Um, on that as well. So after you've, um, you've, you, you've kind of spoken to this patient and you've been dealing with this patient um, with, with, with their, their hypo, um, 
and if it's happening again or any any patients uh, there's other people that um you can uh whose ap ad, uh, expertise you can capitalize on such as um sort of your, your diabetic specialist nurses or the diabetic team as well they'll always be happy to come along and, but firstly give you advice um, and also review the patient as well and it's really useful to kind of learn um from these specialists as well um i always like to think that the hospital is full of so much wisdom from all the different specialties and i think it's really useful if you can kind of um have a chat to them when when you're discussing patients with them uh, just to kind of look, find out a little bit more about what's going on and and learn as you go uh, and that's really really useful okay so or just giving it away we're going on to the next slide so so that's kind of that's three common scenarios that you might um, find yourself in and that can be whether it's a new patient coming into hospital um, or patients you come across when you're doing your on calls on the wards I hope kind of what you can see by the cases that we've gone through is that even if they are you know scenarios that you may have read as an EMQ um, or, or whatever and you think oh you know that's really easy you can, you can bash through them in no time um, just remember that things do take a little bit longer than you might expect and if you do find that things are taking a bit longer it's often because there's lots of steps that you may not have known before uh, and it will become get easier as you get more familiar with working in the hospital. Um, also it's important to know that you aren't alone um, and there are always people to help. Okay um, so Coming on to our last case, I thought this was cute, but I think I've given the game away a bit earlier. Um, the medical student who became a great doctor, okay? Um, that's all of you, okay? So um, there's lots and lots of kind of wisdom um, on the internet and from colleagues in the hospital, etc. cetera, um, just about um, how, how to get used to kind of doctoring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I thought, I don't want to exhaust you with a massive list, but I thought I'd go through a few bits and bobs um, just to kind of set, set you at ease or kind of, make it feel like I'm, 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 I'm doing my bit um, as well. So I think, if, and, and these are kind of based on what me and my colleagues spoke about and kind of what I, when I was reflecting back on what, um, what, what the beginning of foundation was, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so first thing is you'll become, you'll, you will become a better doctor by trying to be a better doctor. Um, I don't want that to seem too preachy. Um, I, I still think about this every day, which is be proactive, um, ask questions, I've said it before, it's here on the slide. The only silly question is the question that you don't ask. Um, just ask questions, ask why. It's absolutely fine to be looking things up. At this point, I don't know how many months you are post finals. There's probably a chance that you've forgotten uh, lots of things. I know going into F1, I certainly had. Um, um, but it is there in your head, and there's nothing wrong with refamiliarizing yourself with it. Um, you know, looking at textbook, looking, looking at wiki geeky medics asking a colleague asking friends that's absolutely fine um sometimes you might find that all your colleagues around you seem to know what's going on don't worry about that because you're in the hospital everyone is projecting a certain level of confidence even if they're not feeling that deeply inside um it's important that you project that confidence too but then let someone know if you're struggling let, let someone know if you're if you're if you're unsure um because that's the best way to be safe Okay, but remember, be proactive, um, ask questions. Um, have something, something to look forward to outside of work. So hobbies, um, talk to people, chat to your mates. Um, you know, a cup of tea fixes most things. A cup of tea and a couple of custard creams fixes all things. Um, but, you know, have something to look forward to when you do leave the hospital, whether it's reading a book, listening to some music, playing football, um, seeing a nice play, anything, wh wh whatever it is, you know, something that keeps you human um, that, that you can look forward to as well okay um we um we set up a a stupid jar in our house <laughs> uh, which is you always find that something funny or something silly or something will happen or someone will say something funny at work um and we'd always come home and talk about that and share stories about that um and then you put money in the jar when it's something that's really really silly but that's kind of a good way to also just having a look at and keeping on the bright side um of things as well okay um fine the next one is kind of be organized that's it's it's easier said than done and everywhere you look everyone who you speak to will say be organized um what does that mean it's well you know it can mean lots of things it's taking a step back when you're feeling you've got lots going on and thinking okay i'm going to make a list i'm going to make a to-do list of things that i need to get done it helps you to prioritize after the ward round once you've done it and everyone's scattering off sometimes it's important to just say everyone can we just group together, make a big list of all the jobs that we've got to do, allocate those lists or allocate those jobs to everyone, and then regroup throughout the day to make sure you're getting through um, that list of jobs. Um, but it's not just being organized at work, it's being organized in your personal life as well, because once work starts, it gets really, really busy. Um, and sometimes 
it's it's difficult to both manage going into work getting ready for work getting your laundry done getting your food done night shifts all of that um and it will take time for you um but you will eventually get into a routine it took took me a while but you know you establish those routines there'll be times when you get it wrong um, and realize the best you can do is go into work wearing damp socks um it does happen uh, it does happen more often than not for some people um but that's fine. Um, it's whatever, whatever you can do to be organized, whether it's sitting down. So I like to sit down on, on sort of a Sunday night. So with my calendar and just plan when I'm going to do things during the week. So when am I going to do my laundry, when am I going to go food shopping, etc. cetera. Um, my mates look at that and think that's a bit nerdy, but it works for me and that's fine. Other people do different things. They prefer to use the downtime on the tube to do that um, or whatever. So just, it, it's important to get organized and it will take time, but it's fine. Take five. It's fine. Okay. Um, and avoid damp socks if you can, but I think it's a rite of passage, really. Um, and lastly, um, just be kind uh, whenever possible. It is always possible. Well, that's a quote. Um, I think it's from the Dalai Lama, actually. Um, but I, I think it holds true. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff going on in hospital. Some of it is not pleasant. Um, but kind of you with your colleagues, you can all make it a really lovely working environment and be there for each other. So be kind to your patients, but also be kind to your colleagues as well. Um, sometimes someone might be a little bit, a little bit arsy to you. Um, that's nothing personal. Maybe they're just having a bad day. Um, and again, it's easier said than done, but take that in your stride. Um, and that's fine. And just kind of spread the love, spread the kindness. Okay. Cool. So that's kind of uh, the summary of everything of, of our of our three cases, um, and then kind of just a bit of bit of extra wisdom about sort of making the most of doctoring, being organised, uh, but also having fun and kind of you know having having a life um, along the way as well because you, you can enjoy doctoring. It's not all stressful and sort of life in the fast lane. There's there's life outside of it. I just wanted you to recognise that. Um, anyway, I hope you found that useful um, and that I've kind of addressed your questions as well. Uh, it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour going through um, some cases. I hope that um, it has kind of been useful hearing about the context that you might experience these cases in uh, and kind of what work will actually be like. Um, and hopefully maybe it's, it's helped you highlight things that you haven't considered before um, and to make um, make the wards a, a, a little less daunting. Um, again, oh, it's got questions. Again, so I was about to say, so if you've got any questions, um, I'll be here for a little while, so I'll be here till eight. So if you just keep, keep coming through um, with questions, that's absolutely fine. Um, and also um, I'm gonna go to the next slide, which is where if you just fill out feedback um, as well um, for this. So this is a list of keywords up on the screen now. Um, and um, if you have any questions, that's my email address. That's Yathu Mahezor, and that's my name, at doctors.org.uk. Um, send me the emails. I will be happy to get back to them um, as soon as possible. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay, and if you have any questions. So, question, what do you carry with you on, on calls? So, firstly, when I do um, on calls, so nights, for example, what I normally wear is sort of chinos uh, and a scrub top just because you've got the pockets. Um, I've got my phone. Um, I will normally take a portable charger with me um, or I'll keep that in my bag just because you, you, you will use your mobile at work um, and running out of battery is just, it, it, it's, it's a silly thing to happen you, you, like you, and it really messes up how you work. So have a portable charger. You have a bleep, um, maybe a pen, two pens um, and a couple of pieces of paper. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's a good investment to have, maybe have a couple of cereal bars or some snacks um, in your bag as well. Um, so that at least, you know, if you're, even if you're just walking between wards, uh, you can ha have a trump on, on a cereal bar or something um, as, as, as you're going along. So anything like that. Cool. Um, I'm just going to put up the last slide um, as well for feedback. So yeah, there's, there's feedback. There's a, there's a Facebook uh, link or a, a QR code, very, very snazzy um, for you to uh, fill out feedback. Okay. Any other questions? I'll just see if there's any private ones as well. Okay, so yeah, so what do you carry for your on calls? Yeah, so I've told you that. So it's pen, paper, um, some snacks if you want, phone, um, and um, you have your, your bleep as well. Uh, I've normally found on, when I've had on calls, even if it's a few minutes, you can always go back to your bag wherever it is, but um, that might be a bit of hassle. Okay, that's fine. Why is it not asking?
Yes. Yeah, so someone's asked, uh, do you ever get called to review a patient and find, and, and, you, and you're stuck on what's going on or any intervention to stop? Yes, absolutely. That, that will happen. That, that will definitely happen. Um, that will definitely, definitely happen. Um, and if that does happen, what you do in that situation is you say, you frankly, you get all the information you can. So you take the history, you do your examination, you do the things that you are capable and competent to do. And then you will phone uh, your, your reg or your senior and say, this is the situation. And you do a nice S bar handover and say, this is what is, this is what's going on. I, I, I don't, something doesn't seem right, but I'm not fully sure what's going on. Uh, please, could you advise me or would you be able to comment and re review the patient as well? Um, the difference between doing that is that you are getting the, as much information as you can do. You're getting the information together so that someone else can go through that and make and come to a conclusion um, rather than just phoning someone and saying, I don't know what's going on. I need help. So there, is, there are always things that you can do, even if it is just gathering information uh, and you will always come to the limit of your knowledge. But it's fine to take it to that point and then ask for help. Okay, someone said, if you need a portable chest x-ray, do you stop at breathing and order it or do you carry on and order it or get someone else to order it? Okay, um, so um, I think if, if, if you're going through that and I think normally when we've done it, you can normally say, can someone go and order that chest x-ray? There's normally been other hands to go and do it. I think it's fine for you to wait to get to the end of your assessment. You've got all the information together and then you can order that, that portable chest x-ray as well. I think if you can get someone to do it, if you've got another pair of hands, by all means, get them to do it. That's fine. Um, done with BMs. So normally when you do, when you do something for your blood sugars, um, you will um try to you will reassess it within sort of 15 minutes um and then you'll keep assessing it if you find that they're still not going up you know after a couple of you know you do do something check the bms do something check the bms after about two three iterations if that's not improving you want to call for help if they are and you know and that's provided that they are conscious and um conscious and they're able to swallow they're not plummeting if they become unconscious as a threatened swallow um threatened airway call for help straight away okay oh where's my mouse done okay sats equals uh, 94 sats is hypoxic um no ideally you want to keep your sats over 94 but if they're 94 that doesn't necessarily mean um that they are hypoxic uh, and it also depends on whether they're on lots and lots of oxygen too so i mean 94 percent um but they're on reams and reams of oxygen um so humidified air whatever um that's when you might think that something's not quite right Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, keep your questions coming in. Um, do I have a clipboard and a stamp? Um, so, so strangely enough, um, we didn't get, I didn't get a stamp, um, in my, in my trust, we didn't get stamps until F2 and that's because I ended up, I was, I was in a different trust. Um, I didn't keep a clipboard. Some people prefer to have a clipboard, um, because you can have a clipboard, you can put your list on that clipboard and it's one of the ones that you can open up and you can put lots of blood request forms in. Um, which I think is, I think that's, that's really, really good. Um, I didn't want to do that because I, I quite like having my hands free. So the way I do it, my, my hands are free and I've, I've used all my pockets and things. And I, I've got my list um, with me. Um, but if, if you'd like to have a clipboard, um, that's absolutely fine. I think, I think it's a really way of, of being organized. And, and there've been times where I've, someone's had a clipboard and it's benefited me. So um, I think that's really, really good to have one, but not, not, not mandatory.
Okay, perfect. So it's coming up, well, it's past eight o'clock now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this before I go, just as a final thing, uh, thanks to the Becoming a Doctor team uh, for sorting all of this out. Um, you know, I think it's really good you're making the most um, of the situation. Um, so obviously do feedback, so this is important for them. And if you've got any questions as well, um, fill out, just, just shoot me an email. Um, one last question. Um, did you enjoy nights or did you find them stressful? Honestly, um, I actually enjoyed them. Um, the reason why is because it gets you a chance to really get stuck in um, and do things. You only get better by doing things again and again. So, you know, re reviewing patients, reviewing unwell patients, you get better at that the more you do it. Um, you know, the cannulas, that you, the cannulas that you do at whatever time in the middle of the night, you get really, really good. Um, you know, there's always those odd, weird conversations that you have with, you know, some of the nursing staff or the other doctors or the HCAs or the porters at 3, 4 a.m., which will stay with you forever. Um, sometimes not mentally scarring you, but they're all lovely. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really good. I think going into nights, I was I was very scared um, because I just because I thought it would just be me. I thought there would be I'd have to do a lot on my own. And I was I, I was to be honest, I was a bit scared of asking for help because I didn't want um, my seniors or whoever on the team to think, oh, he, he's silly. He doesn't know what's going on. Um, but actually, once you get into it, into the rhythm of it, um, you realize that that everyone is a team. Everyone's got that level of expertise for you to benefit from. And so it, you're meant to ask for help. That's fine. Um, and then you just get used to reviewing patients. You get used to doing things. And actually, um, when you look at how far, when, when you, when you look at, when you deal with your first patient, you can only take it so far before you need help. But as you go along, you, you're able to get further and further and further before you need to get help. And, and seeing that transition, um, is really, really nice. Um, I think with kind of getting into your nights and, and the routine, I've kind of, you, you, you might struggle with it at first, kind of finding, finding out what works for you with sleep and food, um, getting your laundry done, all of that in the weeks or, or, or the days that you're on nights. Um, but again, you will fall into a rhythm, a rhythm of it. Um, and actually, you know, I, I, I have enjoyed the nights. Um, and um, looking back, actually, I can't believe I was so terrified of those nights going into it before I started. Um, because because they've been fine even when 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 there have been really unwell patients there is that support there um, and, and you are able to get through it and if there's anything that worries you about what you see on nights or you know something's been particularly hairy um talk about it talk about it okay cool um so i'll just go back to that feedback form uh and then after that we will call it a day so thanks for joining i um, hope that's useful um if you've got any thoughts or any, any feedback that you want to send me whether you like you enjoyed this or you absolutely hated it um let me know all feedback is useful um and uh the tears will dry i promise um so anyway go have a lovely evening um and good luck on the wards and um if we're lucky maybe maybe we'll we'll, we'll meet on the wards someday take care bye